All right. So we have been um, talking. Pastor Nick started a phenomenal message last week. Last week, right? And and she mentioned. I think it was the message was around unraveling the power of joy. In this time, the Bible says in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, it says the kingdom of God is not in eating and in drinking. You know, I was sitting down there today and I said, the kingdom of God is not in MTV cribs. Look at my house. I got four bedrooms. I, I, I eat caviar every day. You know, kingdom of God is not that. Kingdom of God is in righteousness. Kingdom of God is in what? Peace. Kingdom of God is what? Joy. In womb? In the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is not in what we feel like is I'm peaceful. Life is good. Let me just settle down and enjoy what I have of life. The kingdom of God is in righteousness, is in how we live our life, is in the peace of God, is in joy in the Holy Ghost. May I hear you say amen. And so when we think about that, today I want to talk about the importance of joy. The significance of joy. Pastor Nikki talked about uh, what joy is, and she did, did a phenomenal job about what job, what joy is, the who, what, where, what job, why joy. But today I want to focus on what I call the significance or the importance of joy. Oftentimes I hear people who feel like they aren't fulfilled. Have you met those people that they feel like they're chasing something? You know, I, I hear things like, you know what, I, I, I just don't feel like I'm myself. I just want to be like myself. I want to be happy. Whatever makes me what? Happy. Whatever makes me happy. I don't want to live for anyone's dream. I want to live for me. I want to live what makes me happy. And, and, and we have done everything, many of us have done so many things, to go between places to be able to enjoy what happiness is. We've tried our best to find it. You know, you start this job, you don't get it. You go to another job, you start something else, and you don't, we, we're seeking for what brings about fulfillment, what brings about happiness in us, in our lives. Oftentimes, many of us, Oftentimes, we, of, we oftentimes find, um, we, 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 many, many of us as people, we go in search of something deep, something within, something that makes us feel what? Connected. Something that makes us happy. But really, that makes us happy. We, we go looking for what it is. And, and, and you've often heard, thank you. You've often heard that, that when you think about the, the happiness, um, or, or when we think about what we go out to look for when it comes to happiness, we're looking for something that makes us feel like we are, we're full. You know, you, you go to work, you go to school, you study, and then you want to buy the house that makes you happy. You want to buy the car that makes you what? Happy. Before I got my wife a car, she was driving the other car, which I now drive like as if the car was broken. And then she told me and she said, just play something soft. Just something I need you to play consistently. You good? Okay. And so, and so she would say to me, I drive a long distance. I'm like, that's the point of a car. She goes, but I want to feel happy in the car. And I said, what kind of car will make you feel happy? And she said, Range Rover autobiography. <laughs> I said, go talk to your father. He's got his he own <laughs> cattle on a thousand hills. He will give you a Range Rover autobiography. And she picked the color and picked everything. She wants to feel what? Happy. You can't blame her. And so I said, if you don't get your Range Rover today, what would you like? She goes, I want like a, if we can't get rid of it, we got me Ford. And so I went looking for the kind of car she wanted. And I made the mistake two times now. The first car, the first one she got, she goes, I want a car. I want, I want, I want, a, 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 it, was just, it was very specific, a Toyota Camry. It's got to be white. It's got to be really, really cool. I said, okay. So I went to the dealership that day. Uh, it was myself and Pastor Tita. We went there to the dealership that day. The guy was, it was the last day living in the place. And we got the car for him. He said, what car do you got? He said, this is a fully loaded one. It's got more roof. It's got, it's got spoilers. It's an SE version. I said, I want that one. My wife wants it. Got to get her the best one. 
Well, you know, and my wife wanted all the moonroof. By the time she got the car, she had, I think she's open one time. And so I decided to do the same thing this time around. I said, I got the car. I'm like, this car's got fully loaded, everything. I mean, car, it's, I mean, it's got almost, it's not biography, it's not Range Rover, but it's got some bells on whistle that, that I thought was pretty cool. So I got there, one of them, that this has got, it's got massage, right? So you're driving car, it can massage your back. And so I'm driving, we're going on this road trip, and, and I got my wife, never used to anything. And so I'm in this place, I'm on a road trip, I'm the one driving, so I turn the massage, massage my back, and then, and then I turn to my wife, as a very good, nice, nice husband. My wife says, turn it off. I said, why not do you buy a car that's got a massage, and you wouldn't use a massage? Because we, she wanted to be what? Happy. You can't blame a woman who wants to be happy. And that's oftentimes what happens. We go buy a house that want to make us happy. We go buy things. We do things in our lives that make us happy. I don't blame you. You need to be happy. Say to your neighbor, I need to be happy. I, I deserve it. And uh, whenever you want to make yourself feel good, you say, I work too hard. Not to have that thing. Even though if I have to get in debt, I'm working. That's right. But then what is happiness? See, happiness is an ephemeral. Ephemeral word is short-lived. It's an ephemeral state based on feelings, experience, fulfillment, or result of a desired outcome. In other words, happiness is when I look at something that I want to get, I feel like I need it, and I always attached to something that I either get or want to get. Happiness is never a standalone thing. You can't say, I got happiness. Because almost all the time, happiness is tied to something. Everything I just said to you, want to be happy? It's about a chase. Happiness is about what I want to get and where I want to go and what I want to do. I want to get married to my wife or wife, wife of my dreams. I am happy. I want to get the job of my dreams. I'm happy. If I can marry that person, I will be happy. You've heard people say that. If I get that raise, honestly, the difference is $2. If I get that $2, it would transform my life. How many people have been in that place before, right? If I get that 20%, I know my target number. When I get that target number, that is where I'm going. And you get the target number, and then a week later, you're like, I think I got cheated. And you know, a, a month later, you're like, man, they're overusing me for this moment they're giving me. And, and about a year later, you're like, you ask your friend how much he's making. It's like, man, I'm making said No, they're cheating me. They're cheating me. But we are chasing that. If I would just get that one, I would be happy. We'll look at the moment and whatever we look for, whatever we attain, whatever we achieve, at that moment, that instant, it brings about what you've been searching, which is just happiness. But is happiness what we're looking for? I remember I, I got a job one time and everything looked good on paper. The job was great. Pays well, does everything well. Until I got inside the place and realized that the, the culture didn't fit me. The boss wasn't my kind of boss. The organization doesn't regard people. The team isn't the team I wanted, but I was happy to get the job. When we attain and become happy, we realize that after you've attained it, you realize that that moment, it's for that gratification of a moment, but then it's really, really short-lived. Is there really a continuous state of happiness that satisfies the complexity of human needs? There's not. There's never a continuous state of happiness because you've often heard people go in pursuit of happiness. You've seen the movie? There's never a continuous state of happiness that makes us feel like we can live okay. 
Because if it's not this today, there's going to be something else tomorrow. And when you get what you want today, you feel you're happy and you're okay. Until you wake up the next morning and realize that, okay, I have already attained to this one. Now, I need to do the what? The next one. And you begin to attach that next one to happiness, right? And man, you know this, the woman says, I, buy, I want to buy one shoe. And she buys that food, that shoe, and she's happy. And then the next day, she goes, I don't have it in red. I don't have it in red. And you're like, well, who cares about if you have it in red? It's like, you really need a red? No, I can't wear that red dress until I have the red shoe. I said, red dress is in the closet because of red shoe. Because now, that same thing that was attained in black, by the time you think about red, attaches to your happiness. So is there a consistent state that happiness gives you that allows us to be, that meets the complexity of man? Somebody say no. That's where the difference happens with joy. You see, when they were joy, joy is shown to be the natural outcome of a fellowship with God. You see, joy is always rooted in hope, not in a thing. If you look at the scripture over and over again, whether Romans chapter 15 verse 11 or is it 13, the scripture over and over again, it says that even when you look about, when you think about that one in, in, in the one we just read, and, and it says that uh, for the kingdom of God is not what? Um, it's not what? In, it's, in, it's in drinking, but it's in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. There's something about joy. Joy comes, it gives you hope when you don't even see it. it. Joy gives you peace to say, I don't have it yet, but I got joy. Joy is never attached to something that makes you feel good. Joy is not a feeling of, I just feel good about it. Joy is a feeling or is a moment of delight. It's a continuous experience of delight. Joy is rooted from inside out. Happiness is outside in. Joy says, I have the joy in me. And joy is not something you get by talking to somebody or by attaining or by obtaining something. Nobody ever buys a car and said, you know, I got this car. I have joy. You rarely hear them. You hear them say, I am what? Happy. Joy is always rooted in something that allows you to flourish regardless of circumstances around you. It requires no proof. Joy requires no proof. You don't go, you don't say, I'm joyful. Like, what, you got a raise? No, 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 I'm just joyful. You almost look like you've lost your mind if you tell someone you're joyful. And there's nothing else to happen that, that, that's attached to it, right? So joy comes from them. Joy is not dependent on what is around you, but joy is dependent on who is inside of you. Say with me, who is inside of me? Joy is not about what's around me. Joy is about what? Who's inside of me? That's why you can find a man of joy in the middle of turmoil, and he is still joyful. And the People will not understand why is this guy still joyful despite the situation around him. One of the most things, one of the greatest things I cherish about people who get to know God fully is that they realize that their survival and their experience is not based on, or their survival and their encounters in life is not based on, on, on what they obtain. Some people are going through some serious pain and challenges in life, yet they're joyful. I heard the story of a man who in his church, I think he's got one of his debilitating diseases, right? multiple sclerosis, one of them. The debilitating disease that, that, that I don't know, I, I forgot the name, but it's one of those things that, that it's an autoimmune disease that just keeps going down, down, down. The doctors and nurses can help me out here, and if they can't help me, then TBS. Uh, okay, we will just think about it this way. He's got debilitating disease that goes down this way. Okay, so, and I remember the guy, and this is the story. This is the pastor sharing the story, the man's pastor. And he's talking about that the man's job was to help his, um, um, to welcome people to church. And so the man would come around and welcome people to church all the time. And then the disease began, began to come in. It said that he was, well, you know, when you welcome people to church, you, 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 you can't be based on happy. It's joy. And so the disease came around. And then when the disease, disease came around, the guy would still be, be, be welcoming people. It's one of those diseases that it goes, starts with a leg. and be, Is it MS? Yes, that's one they said. 
that exact one they said. Yes. So if it starts with a leg and then it'll be eating all the way up. Yes, that one that they all said. So that was the disease. And so the guy will be, he will go. But every time he never missed church, the pastor will come to him and say, you know, you had a severe an attack yesterday. Why don't you stay home and not show up? He says, no. He says, I've got life in me. i got to give God the best for myself. And he will be happy and rejoice. Listen, they had to buy him a golf cart and had someone drive him because he wouldn't stay at home. So someone drives in a golf cart. He's welcoming people in the golf cart because he couldn't drive the golf cart. So someone's driving, but his joy was radiant. You know when the pastor was feeling bad for you? That is a joy that is not from happiness. That's the difference. He goes, I've got the lungs, the breath of God in me. I've got life in me. This is what he called me to do. And until he takes me out of this world, I will be joyful. Now we have hands and legs. We've got everything, but we're waiting for that next step to make us happy. But that's not what God says. God says, you look right inside of you because already inside of you, there is joy. Because this, the, the one I want to give to you is not based on outside in, it's based on inside out. That's why the Bible says He gave us the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of joy. Why? Righteousness, peace, and what? Joy where? In the Holy Spirit, Galatians chapter 12, verse 22 and 23. And the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, gentleness, and um, long-suffering and patience. It goes on and on, right? It says that that's what the fruit of the Holy Spirit is. So if we've got joy in us, it means that the Holy Spirit resides in us. And he's, he's the, the joy that God gives us is a fruit of the Spirit. Many people who get addicted, many people who get addicted to carnal things in search of lasting joy, but you never find it. That's why you see people who are very, and I'm not joking around or playing around with, 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 with mental illness. That's not what it is. But what I'm saying is this is a part of reality. People get and amass everything thinking that's where I'm going to find that peace, that joy. But you see, you cannot chase a thing to give you peace. Let me say that again. You can never chase a thing to give you peace. Peace is not something you get when you get there. Peace is something that comes from God. May I hear you say amen. And so, you know, in, 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 in the scripture, it says that, that we have to learn to obtain what it means, this, this, this joy from the word of God. Joy from the presence of God. Joy from the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you that life wouldn't happen to you. I just told you a story about a man. I can't tell you life can't happen to you. Life wouldn't happen to you. But one thing I can tell you is this. That when life comes, it's the joy that keeps you above the ground. When life happens to you, it's joy that makes you able to ride it on. It's joy that makes people not pity you. You are not created to be a pity of the world. You're created to be a light to the world. So when joy comes in, when the Holy Spirit is working and dealing with you and you're growing in joy, even though they say there's a casting down, you don't know how, you don't know when, you don't know where, but you know that God is working for you. The Bible says in John chapter 16 verse 33, it says in this world you're going to face trials. You're going to face challenges. You and I are going to face the challenge. The, the, our husbands is going, to, is going to misbehave. Our wives will misbehave. Our children will misbehave. Our bosses, we will lose jobs. I'm not praying for anyone. Life happens. And sometimes it might be because God wants to promote you. But life happens. And because life happens, we don't lose our joy to circumstances. Don't make a permanent decision from a temporary circumstance. We don't lose our joy to our feelings, to our circumstances, because that is not the end. That's not the end. If you're going to win in life, you need joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 13, verse 52, the Bible says, And the disciples were, you know, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the Bible says how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. In Acts chapter 13, verse 52, the Bible says, And the disciples, let's go together, one to go. And the what? 
were filled with joy and what? With the Holy Spirit. They were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 we talked about it. So why, why is joy that comes from the Holy Spirit that important? Why is joy that important? The joy that comes from the Holy Spirit, why is it very, that important? Number one, I'll tell you this. Number one, it is the secret to a fulfilled life. Joy that comes from the Holy Spirit is the secret to what? A fulfilled life. You know, it's how I have a fulfilled life, a great life, a life without regrets. I may chase something, but how many more things am I leaving behind when I'm chasing to obtain something else? Joy in the Holy Spirit, joy that comes from the Holy Spirit is so important because it's what allows you to become what God wants you to become. You see, because God is looking for people who are joyful. Jesus said, my joy I give to you. It says that, that your joy may be full. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 8 verse 10, it says what? It says that the joy of the Lord is what? My strength. The joy of the Lord is my, is my strength. In Psalm chapter 16 verse 11, the scripture says that, that you have shown me, let's go to that, you have shown me, it says you will show me the path of life. In other words, here's the thing. He says, I don't know how life is going to go. I've never lived this life before. And people of God, I've never lived this life before. I, I, there's so much in life that I cannot control. There's so much challenges that face that, 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 that I cannot control. And let's, let's be real. It happens to all of us. Right? There's so much in life I don't know. I don't know what's happening in the next 20 years. I don't know what's happening in the next five years. I don't know what's happening tomorrow. I don't know what's happening in 2022. But the Bible says, you will show me the path that I should go. Because in your presence. In other words, I will know the path I should go. Because I reside in your presence. Because in your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand there's pleasures forevermore. The secret to a fulfilled life is when you can find that joy in His presence. If you want to find, if, if you want to find where joy is... Find where the God's where God's presence is. You may say to yourself, but I what is it? You said joy, you said happiness. I don't even know what the difference is. I'll tell you this: spend time, find God's presence. Find, find God's presence. Choose. Let me let me tell you this, and this is this baffles me all the time. I believe, and this is true, I, I've seen it because I find myself in both sides of a spectrum. We doubt what God can do because we have not spent time enough with God. When you see a believer that's thinking, that's using logical mindset to evaluate certain things, they have not spent time with God. Because the Bible says he uses the logical things of this world to confound what? Why? The foolish things. He says if you're going to be a believer, you have to understand that there are two opposing ends. There's a kind of thinking, there's a, there's a spiritual thinking. That sometimes the world will say, it's not possible. And in the same place, God will say, it is possible. The logical thing might say, listen, this world, uh, logical thing might be like, you know what? There's no way there. This can never work. And God will say, this has to work. You have to choose every time who you're going to spend. But the question is this, how would you know what God is saying if you don't spend enough time with God? So to you, let me give you this. And, and God shared me and it broke me down a bit. The average American spends, well, the American family spends seven hours watching TV per day. They may say not you. They may be not, yours might be 16. That's okay. <laughs> yours might be four. Point is average. The TV is on an average family for seven hours in a day. Imagine if we spend three hours with God. What you learn from TV, what you... And, and it's so, so true. You know, I was watching something I sent it to my wife. Uh, the truth about it is that a scientist back and, 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 and went back and said something. He said, the scientist said that he was looking at a tree. He said, many days, many, these days, most PhD students don't want to observe what nature is. Most, most PhD students don't understand what practical science is. He said what they do is they go, the only way they can believe anything is when it has a peer review. 
So peer review is where you write a paper and then your your peers will review the paper. That's when you take that paper as gospel. But nobody actually goes outside and say, is it true what all these peers are talking about? Is it really true? And so the guy was frustrated that he said, nobody comes out. You want to be a botany, you want to be a a botanist, you want to be a botanist, you want to be a this, but you don't go out in the field. Why? Because these days we're all about what's the quick information I can get. What is the Instagram of what I need to get? What do I need to do? Because these days we don't need to recycle information. So whatever information has been dumped inside that place becomes the information we keep carrying on. Are you with me? And so what happens? I was sharing something the other day. I said, imagine this. You have a boss. You come to work that day. The boss is very, very frustrated at you. He's mad at you. Cushing you out and telling you you're doing a bad job. And you're wondering why did, what happened? Why this guy woke up on the wrong side of bed today? Not knowing that the day before, his wife Mary was mad at him because he let the cat out and the cat had whatever was sick. So here's the thing. You are having a bad day the next day because somebody's cat. You see, you don't see that. What you see is you woke up on the wrong side of bed. But what was the original thing? We don't know. If you trace it back, I mean, it happens to all of us. How many times have you responded to your children because you and your wife are having a disagreement? The holy people, you can put your hands down. The children of God can raise their hands up. How many times have you gone back to work and done that? But the truth about it is that, you know, the interesting thing, what you disagree with your wife might be something so minute. That it doesn't have to happen to the kids. But we've all done that. It doesn't make it right. The truth about it is that we are experiencing what somebody else is facing. So we carry this information on and on and on. But if we're going to live the life that God has called us, we have to get to know God First hand, I will preach the word to you, but it is not enough. It's in His presence that you get joy. The word of God is not where, my preaching is not where the joy comes in. It's what you do with the word. When you take the word and you stay, spend time, four hours, three hours, 30 minutes, 10 minutes. And say, God, today I'm going to receive joy in your presence. When we do that. If we can take that time to say, I'm going to receive joy in your presence, then it doesn't matter whose cat went outside. It doesn't matter what the guy says to you the next day. The joy did not come from that person's cat. It didn't come from the fact that your boss is happy from you with you. The joy comes from what? Spending time in the presence of God. So that when you get to work, the guy says, there's going to be this today. You stand up and say, well, it's okay. We know that it's going to be all right. And he wonders, why is this guy different? That is how we live our life in the workplace. It's not because of what the workplace does. It's because of what we do in God's presence. Secret of life, of a fulfilled life, is what? It's a f- value of joy. The fulfilled life, now, now when, when I'm, I, I put down here, happiness is fleeting, but joy is resilient. When, when I have the presence of God, then I'm plugged into the source of life. In Psalm 36 verse 9, it says, For with you is a fountain of life. In your light, we see light. The same scripture, Psalm 16 verse 11, is repeated in the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 28. And I love the way that one says it. It says, You have made me know the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. You've made me know the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Now notice, I think about this. When I have the presence of God, then like I said, I'm plugged into the source of life. Now, you may be sad, discouraged, overwhelmed. Your desire, your ability to receive joy is when you thirst, you desire, you hunger after God's presence. When we pray, when we study, when we serve, and when we love God, you would have that secret of great life. It's not in what you're chasing. Stop blaming your husbands for not making you happy. He was not there when your father created you. Stop blaming your wife for the reason why you're not happy. She has nothing to do with it. It's amazing we grew up and we want the spouse to be the source of joy for us. No, brothers, no, sisters, I want to be honest with you today. I did the same thing. My wife was the problem. She would say the same thing to me. 
She thought I was a problem. And I thought she was a problem. And so we will find two problems facing each other is mountain of more problems. Until I said to God, this can't be this way. He said he has made you the head, so be the head. So get back in and find, Lord, what does it mean for me to be the head? And then go back and say, Lord, teach me what you want me to do. And I, I spent time asking God that. I realized that my wife was not my source of joy. Why did she do this one? Now I'm unhappy. I told that 10 times. I thought the other day we were having a, 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 a retreat. I think it was a, a, a minister's get together me and retreat. And, and, <laughs> and someone was saying to me, said, um, I, that your wife is now very great with, with uh, budgeting, she does budgeting, but very good with keeping to what we said. I said, that one, I've left it a long time ago. Because I need to be fulfilled. I need to have joy. Because if I leave it to when my wife is going to get that, and she gets it. But there was always that one thing. And my personality is, we can avoid that one thing. That one thing doesn't have to happen. And her life and personality is like, it's just one thing. No, that one thing matters. No, it's just one thing. I mean, it's just one thing. If you ever tell my wife to go, dude, she's going to be mad at me about this, but that's okay. If you ever tell my wife to go buy something, and she goes and buys it, she just go, yeah, I just got that one. Maybe it's a $50 thing. And she goes, I just got that one. I'm like, well, we didn't talk about that part of that. It's not that one. She goes, it's only $50. I'm like, love, I know it's only $50, but you did budget for that $50, but it's only don't say only when you've already done the thing. It doesn't happen now. It's the only is, is before, not after. You see, there's nothing wrong with that. But the truth about it is this. When we attach our joy and our happiness to what the person does or does not do, we have not really found out what joy is. Say to your neighbor, joy is inside. Out. What we look for in marriage, in jobs, in careers, in profession, in, it's the status of outside, in. And when they don't give you that accolade, when they don't give you that, that, that recognition, when they don't give you that, that feeling of outside, in, guess what happens? You begin to lose your joy. You feel like that's not the right place for me. They don't celebrate me. They don't do this for me. I'm not saying you should not be celebrated, but I'm saying let your joy resonate from where? Inside. You got to choose and say, I'm going to have joy. So your, your, I, I usually say when I was working, I would tell people, I said, you know, don't let your, 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 your bad day, leave it on the door, by the door. Don't, don't, don't ruin, don't come here and give me a bad day. You, some people are bad day magnets. No matter what happens, they will see the negative side of it, right? Like, it can't know this was going to... I had a guy like that. Oh, walked to my office. Hey, Cola, it's not working. I said, go back outside, make it work. Then come back in here and tell me what's working. I'm tired of not working. Don't ruin my day because of the way you're thinking. And that's what happens. Whether in our homes, whether in our families. Your kids have a bad grade and they've never seen you like that before. Kids make a mistake and we lose it. That's not joy. When kid makes a mistake and they expect you to lose it, and you're like, you show them love and you, and they're surprised and they say, "I thought I was going to be disciplined." And you go, you know, I think you learned your lesson already. So you're not dependent on them to make you feel that way. The fulfilled life is not in the presence of happiness, but in joy that comes from the presence of God. Number two, number one is, it's a secret to fulfill life. Why is joy in the Holy Spirit important? It is the access to the well of salvation and inspiration. What I mean by this is this, you know, Go with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. The scripture says, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Remember when Jesus met that woman at the, the well of Sychar, right? And, and met the woman at the well. Remember that he said, If you know 
with water I can give you, the living water. It says, the water I can give you, it's not the water. It says, when you drink of that water, you what? Never thirst again. It's not about the physical water. It's about the water that comes from God. That you never thirst again. I don't know about you, but I want that water. In other words, it says, you're not just going to be happy with, it's not, I'm not giving you happy. I'm giving you what? Joy. I'm giving you something that we'll never have to lack, never have to wonder. Something that would always be part of you. That once you discover it, your life will never remain the same again. It says, I'm going to give you joy. I'm going to give you water, living water. And, and the an interesting thing about that is this, that there's a joy in the Holy Spirit that allows you to drain. There's a joy that has, gives you works, access to the well of salvation. You see, uh, David, and uh, you know the story of David and, and, and um, Bathsheba, and, and David, after he had done that in Psalm 51, was where he wrote the psalm of his repentance. So go with me to the book of Psalm 51, verse 12. Psalm 51, verse 12, 11 and 12. That's where he wrote the, his, 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 um, his, uh, his psalms of repentance. And in that psalm, he said something which is really, really powerful, and I want us to share, talk about it. It says what? Now watch this. Remember that in the presence of the Lord is what? It's first of darkness. But you know, you use scriptures to answer scripture, to respond to scripture, all right? In the mouth of two or three witnesses, the truth shall be established. Now it says what? In the presence of God is fullness of God. But it says, do not what? Cast me away from your presence. It says, and do not what? Take the Holy Spirit. Now he knows this, that if you take me from his presence, I've lost what? Joy. Then he says this. He says, if, I, if you take the Holy Spirit from me, I've lost what? Joy. Because the fruit of spirit is joy. So I lose joy. It says, go back to 11. It says, do not take away the, the cast me from your presence. Now, now, I don't know about you, but your ability to fail and to be wrong and do wrong things and feel like it's not working, is not the end. The biggest problem we have is not that we failed. The biggest problem we have is that we lost our joy. When you leave God's presence, it's not because you failed. It's because you've lost joy. Now you cannot. Have you ever, have you ever uh, gone away from God's presence? You, everything becomes an attack. You feel like you're open and you're what? Naked. You feel like things are coming at you. And you don't know where to run to. And you feel like, uh, where can I hide? Why? The reason is because we have left the presence of God. That's when you are. The devil has more power in our minds when we leave the presence of God. What do I mean by that? Have you ever tried when well, you're not in God's presence, you know you're not right with God? You have fear, you have concern, you have worry in your mind. You have all these things overwhelming your mind because you know you're not in the presence of God. And because you're not in the presence of God, you feel like you, feel like you have uh, lost it all. You're worried. That's why you know that the the village uh, doctor can get to you. That's why you'll be suspecting everybody around you. Because you're not in the presence of God. In the end, David says, listen, I don't want to lose my joy. The most important thing is your presence for me. And then here's one thing he now says in verse 12. It says, restore unto me. Now I've lost the, the don't let me lose your presence. Don't, don't, lo don't let me lose all that, but it says, restore unto me, because if I lose those things, I lose joy. But it says, restore unto me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. In other words, there's something in salvation that births joy like never before. There's something about being saved that you cannot get from anywhere else. There's a story about a guy that, that I added a, 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 a coffee with my neighbor, and he was a Muslim. He said, oh, I was a Muslim. For many years, I was a staunch Muslim. A big Muslim, a pretty staunch one. And he said, but what happened one day? He was working with this man and this person started to reflect God. He started to see God in this person. And then he said, these people, the way he carried himself, the way he treated his family, the way he said, he was saying something's different. I'm talking about the Muslims that if you change, they will behead you. And then he said, you know, there's something there. And they said, but these people now said, invite him to one, one moment. He said, if you want to know how, what makes me happy, what makes me the way I am, come to this service. That guy came to the service. He said, when he was at the service and he was there, and they were talking about that. 
He said, he sat down on the seat, right, few rows behind. He said, then they made this altar call. He said, Kola, I felt like there was lead, like bricks holding me down. And I could not. He said, but when they made that altar call, he said, he just not know what happened, but he couldn't wait to get to the aisle. He just jumped right over and he came to the moment. And he said, the moment he came, the moment he came, he said, everything just he felt like a feather. You could push him this way and he could fall off. You see, he had the, le- the lead, the heaviness removed and the joy in salvation restored. He said, every pain of what will my family think, it just went away. He said, then God put the joy in me. His two siblings, he's got I think six or seven siblings. Two of his siblings have come to know the Lord. His parents are on the journey to know them. They're seeing a difference in him. See, he has had an encounter. He knows what joy is. He can see, he can smell, he knows that it's knows that it's a joy that comes from salvation. There are some things you would never know about joy until you get closer to God. You may be here and you might think to yourself that you know what? I don't know what you're talking about. You don't know where I'm going. You don't know my life. You don't know what I've been through. I had a story of this guy. Did drugs. One day came back home, realized that his his family. His family left him. His wife told him several times and left him. That day he took a shotgun and wanted to shoot himself. And, and after a while, he tried a few times and didn't. Then he just felt that God, he, that moment, he just felt there was an inkling of God in his heart. And then he, he started writing, poured his heart out on the paper. He wrote the paper up. And that lifted a few things and was just talking to God about. Didn't know him, but he was writing to a God he did not know. And not long afterwards, um, they gave him probation. Well, he failed the drug test, didn't probation. His parole officer told him he had to go to jail for one year. In jail, he met with God. John the Fellowship met with God. Came out of jail and he decided he didn't want to do that again. Now, one of the times he knew about a church, the only we knew about the name of a church was one of the days on Halloween, he was going trick-or-treating with his kids. And there was this man that was, and he was stoned, obviously. And there was this man that talked about, hey, just come to this church. That's how he knew the name of the church. That church, that name stood, and he went to the church, and when he came to church, he just felt people just welcomed him. People just loved on him. Didn't care where he was, where he was coming from. They just loved on him. He finished one of the family says, you know, would you like to come to lunch with us? Took him to lunch and said, you know what, can you come to life group, sort of a cell group with us this evening? He went to cell group and, and despite that, he had failings and shortcomings and, and he went back, met to his girlfriend. They were not married at that time. He met to his girlfriend and, 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 you know, he now told them that he wanted to live a life of living fully for God. This is a guy that sold, his job was selling drugs. His job was dr- kingpin. Many months after, God began to change him. This same guy went to, his wife saw that, God restored their marriage. His guy, this same guy went to, went to the places where they sold drugs. The gang members began to know God. Single-handedly, he brought about a transformation in the city that the mayor recognized him. Mayor. That he's a single-handed person that has converted more this the man the president of my story said they now have more uh, veteran gang members in the church veteran than than non-gang members change that the chief of police said he never knew that this because he knew story this person was going to be transformed that way you see when he experienced the joy in salvation it didn't matter what anybody else felt His life was different. It's enough of complaining, enough of telling people you're the reason for my problem. You need to face it and say, Lord, restore to me what? Joy of your salvation. Help me know who I am in you. Because when I know who I am in you, the world is, the, the world is, the world will know. I will be dangerous for you. I say this, we have hesitation because we don't want to pay the price of God's presence. I can tell you, whatever you're chasing around, money, fame, relationship, family, whatever you're chasing around, 
There's an adage in my, uh, in my old country that what you're looking for, it's not translatable. What you go out looking for in another place is inside your pocket. <laughs> in other words, there's another one that says, the, 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 and, and I'm going to try to be, 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 be true, but it's just the, 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 the leaves or the, the insects that eat vegetables. It's not from outside. It's from the inside of the vegetable. And what that means is this, that you're going around thinking my wife is going to be the one that will help me. She, she needs to behave herself. My husband, he needs to behave himself. My kids, can you imagine what my kids are doing? My, my boss, if that guy is removed, that's going to be it. But God is saying, that's not it. You, we all would not have bosses that are good. But if the joy of the Lord is our salvation, our bosses can be changed because of joy, because of us. You know, the Bible says, in 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, Wives, even if your husbands don't behave, it says, through your conduct, they can be changed. There's a, there's a place in the well of salvation that makes you say, Lord, I spent some time, thank you, I said I spent some time with God recently and and I thought I was going to hear from God about what He wanted me to do. And God started to break me down. And I was just there sobbing in His presence. And what He said to me, He said, when the world is throwing everything at you, I've never left you. He says, I, I, I don't leave you. So the problem is that you forget that I'm there. Because you're chasing the happiness that comes from everything else. And that means we, you got to let go of some friends. You got to let go of what people think about you. Because you can never please anybody. Sometimes our approval and, and okay is coming from what our parents think about us. You know, they've told us this and so I want to just make them happy. Like I told you, my friend, it's the joy and salvation that changed his parents, not him trying to please his parents. We've got it around and we've got to start turning around and realize that God wants to use you. And that's why he wants to give you joy. That's why it's important to have God's joy. Because when you have it, the world is a new place. You see the world from inside of God's view, not from what is happening. I'll give you one more and we'll go. The third one is, please flip it over. Joy is a vitamin for great health and vitality and total being. How do I know joy is a vitamin? You know, the Bible says, clearly says, in Proverbs 17, 22, says, a cheerful heart, what? Is good medicine. But a crushed spirit dries off the bones. <laughs> Happy heart makes the face cheerful, but a heart ache crushes the spirit. My wife and I were dating, dated six years. About the fourth year, my wife called me. She says, I want to spend more time with God. I said, what does that mean? I, mean, I need a break to spend more time. I said, well, let's talk about the kind of break we're talking. Is it break, break, or break, or break? She goes, no, it's break. She needs to spend time. I said, define spend time with God. So she goes, uh, I just need to be by myself. I said, okay, no problem. So what I did was I started to encourage her. Every so often I call her. I said, if it's not me, God will give you someone better. But just so, so you know too. God will give me somebody better. <laughs> Let's just do that. This, this thing, God loves both of us the same way. He gives someone better, He will give me somebody better. And every time I encouraged her, I went and got uh, tapes. And I, I put, I made a collection of tapes. One of them was uh, Whitney Houston. And I will always love you. <laughs> That's a delayed response right there. Another one was uh, Susan Tedeschi. It says, uh, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts so bad. You're the one I first loved, I ever loved. And I would sing, play the uh, CD time. And I'll play the CD, it's a mixtape. And I'll play the CD and I'll be, be there experiencing something to lift my 
spirit. It was the wrong songs to lift your spirit, by the way. Because it was actually making me feel like I'm losing something. But I was telling, no, God is going to give some better. God's going to give me some better. But I was, it was the wrong thing. So when I graduated from that, I started listening to um, jokes. I like listening to comedians, good ones, so not the bad ones. I like listening because at that time, it would, it would just, just give you something to laugh about. You see, until God start realizing that I am enough for you. Sometimes we look around and surround ourselves with people, people that are going somewhere that gives us that mind to know that we're bigger than what we are. And that's okay. Because you need that opportunity to reflect God's joy. A merry heart does good like what? Medicine. I can't remember one of those days I got this, this um, Jesse Duplant is a preacher, very funny guy, and, and he would put, he, he took all his, uh, his tapes where he laughed, where he cracked jokes, and they put all together. I bought all the volumes, and I'll be playing the volume. I still have the tape, this stuff today. I bought all the volumes, I'll be playing, and this is a preaching message, but he'll be laughing, he'll have some fun moments there. I wanted to be joyful. And it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to have that joy. It's okay to, to, to want to create that joy, to want to experience that joy, to have vitality. Don't wait till things are bad. You know, the Bible says, I saw this for the first time, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. I saw for the very first, verse 25. I saw it for the very first time, and, and I've read the Bible, read that part before, but that one just blew my mind away. And Proverbs chapter 15, verse 12, verse 12, verse 25. Can we read it together? One to go. Ah, no, no, no. One to go. Ah, did you know that? Now, go to Mayo Clinic, go to all this WebMD. They will tell you that when you're worried too much, there's, some, there's an illness that says that when you're worried that something's going to happen to you, it's a disease. And it causes the physical impact because of worry. But the Bible says anxiety, worry in the heart of a man causes what? Depression. I didn't write that book. It says, but a good word makes it glad. What is a good word? In John chapter 16, John chapter 15, Jesus said, These words I have spoken to you, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Joy terminates sorrow of the heart. There's never an overdose of joy. But when you take that vitamin every time, it keeps depression away. Not my word, his word. And that joy is not something that comes from, from things around, it comes from the Lord. Joy is in the Lord. Bow down your heads for a second. I don't know what you walked inside or those watching me online. I don't know what you walked inside here with. I know one thing for sure. God does not want you to live the same way. Listen, one of the biggest things you got to do as her people is learn to surrender. It's learn to let go. You're not asking for joy for me, but for yourself. David was called the man after God's heart, yet he messed up. And in that mess up, he said, if I cannot take his presence, if that's taken from me, I've lost everything. Now, I'm going to give an opportunity here to let's come back to his presence if there's anyone in this place that you know you're not in his presence what i mean by his presence is that's not your most cherished place you're not there you visit but you know you're not living in his presence in other words you don't know him you don't have that relationship with him you feel like there's something missing or maybe you're one of those that, that you've looked for happiness from things around you from things that have to go right before you can be happy well here's an opportunity for a change if you have never known the joy of salvation never said I know God I want you to raise your hand and I will pray with you
I'm going to call the second group of people. If you know you know God, but you're not in the presence or you're lacking that joy that comes from Him, I want to pray with you. Would you raise your hand? If you want God to restore you to that place of joy. Anybody? I see that hand. Anybody wants to join in? Hallelujah. Thank you for that hand. I want you to just put your right, that hand right on your chest. And I want you to fall in love with him again and say, Lord, thank you. I love you. Can we start afresh? Come in and take everything I have. Because I surrender it to you. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Help me cherish your presence more than anything else. Help me grow in you. In Jesus' name. I pray for the peace of God upon you. I pray that his joy resides in you right now. In Jesus' name. Good morning, church.